Hey kids, it's Dresden James, and on this Dresden James Explains, we're looking at mollusca. So in general, with animals like the kingdom of Animalia, we have subgroups. So chordata, meaning animals with spinal cords, that's like fish and us and like mammals and birds and all that. Uh, arthropods are essentially bugs, you know, trilobites, truck roaches, horseshoe crabs. Mollusca are, for the casual observer, clams, snails, squid, octopi, basically. So they're very big parts of the fossil record. But unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of toys these guys. So I'm going to show you how they kind of work and why they're so important. The first one I want to show you is actually called a bivalve. Bivalve being two shells because clams and pectin and all the other oysters have two shells. A little line right there showing different shells. That little tongue looking thing is actually the, the stomach. So uh, clams are sediment feeders. They actually eat dirt. Well, they don't eat dirt. They eat the nutrients in the, around the dirt or things in the dirt. So they'll take it in a cock and worm and they'll pull out their nutrients. So that's the part of the stomach that's used to help them burrow down. Now, the next group are called gastropod. Now, gastropod essentially are snails, slugs, you know, nudibranchs. So if you look at a, a fish tank with a snail in it, you'll see the snail like on the glass and there'll be something in the middle doing this. That's actually its stomach helping it move along. So they actually crawl on their stomach. Gastro means stomach, pod means foot. So there are very few snail models. So again, if you're doing any kind of uh, prehistoric ocean like diorama or setup, you're gonna want tiny little animals like this in your in your setup. Uh, one thing to point out too is that uh, it, it, they, they have little eye stalks here on some of them. There's different species, different designs. Uh, very kind of cool if you're putting again these background characters in your in your setups uh, for marine life. Another one I found in, a, in, a, in one of the tubes from Safari is a cowrie. Cowrie's really fun because uh, if you see a real cowrie, like a modern like a shell. It's very glossy because the actual animal comes out and goes around like that. And they are closer to snails than they are anything else in our list. But of course, the big players in this group are called cephalopods. Cephalo means head and pod means foot because I can imagine an ancient Greek person looking at an octopus and going, hey, yeah, there's a head with feet coming out of it. The truth is, when you see an octopus or squid, where the eyes are is the head. The feet or arms coming out below. But that part above it, the, the, what would be the giant brain of a supervillain, that's actually the torso. So essentially what you're looking at, and I'll use a giant squid as an example, is that there's the head, here are the arms, and there's the torso. So it's like a switch, switch a rule of what we, we have going on. Now, some of the earliest cephalopods are the Orthoceras, which are very, very, very famous um, fossils. They are um, found a lot in Morocco. They're using jewelry and bookends and decorative pieces. There's this, it's a black rock you can see with like, this white little triangle in it. So what's going on is that here's an example of, of one of these guys. Now this is Orthocer Orthoceros model. And the group are called nautiloids, it's a group. And the idea is that some of the earliest predators we have, uh, at least in the Ordovician at least, is that they have these hard shells. And again, over time we start seeing that they be the shells begin getting more coiled over time, different species of cephalopods. And one of the ideas behind that is if you have a large, long shell, that's really great, you're darting around. But unfortunately, if other predators evolve, you can't really hide that well. So I mean, a smaller shell, more compact, can work. We'll see that later on in the talk. But one thing to point out, this little ultraceros, which I love, people see this little hole, this little thing right here, and they go, oh, wow, what is that, like the anus or something, or the mouth? No, in the middle of cephalopod, this, this model doesn't show it, but in the middle, they have a, thing, a beak. So octopi, squid, they all have beaks, basically, in the middle of their arms. Uh, it's really kind of cool. And this little thing here's got a hyponome or a funnel. So whenever you see like the nature shows and the octopus is being annoyed and it expands and shoots away, what you're seeing there is it's pushing water out of the, like a jet propulsion. Like when a transformer, like that, same thing, but with water. So uh, one thing to point out too with this guy is, is that um, we normally find only this part fossilized because the shell's hard, this is all soft bits. We don't find that part. And many times the ones you see are cut in half, you see different chambers on the inside. Uh, this is a very nice one too. Uh, this is Collect A right here. And this is one I was really sh shocked by. It was really cool because I didn't know that they were coming out with this. And uh, it too has a hyponome on the back there. So it's usually on the bottom side of this design based on modern species. But we have found Orthoceros and Nautiloid relatives that are, uh, the soft parts are preserved. They're actually in prints like that. So it's kind of cool too. Um, but in this one, you can, see, you can actually see the beak on the inside in the middle. It's really, really neat. Um, and again, that's what they used to tear their food apart. But... I will sh tell you actually a little secret. My first Nautiloid set were actually these two guys from Dinosaur Train. I think that I, I don't watch Dinosaur Train as much, but um, they're like a married couple. So they're holding hands and all that. And they were very, the face is very anthropomorphic. You know, their eyes are higher like that. But anyway, uh, so next we're going to go over are the ones that are the hollow form. So for example, we have bell knights. Now bell knights are really cool. And even though they're found throughout the Mesozoic, uh, Jurassic and Cretaceous particularly, I uh, like these because where 
not always have an outer shell and you're kind of stuffed into it. These guys, the shells on the inside. So if you ever see a, a Belenite shell, they're like uh, they're like bullets, basically, you know, a little like that. And the idea is that they uh, uh, we know that these guys are eaten by by plesiosaurs because we actually find those shells in plesiosaur stomachs. So again, if, if you're wanting to collect for just fun and have like neat, neat cool stuff, that's cool. But if you're looking for more of a like an ecology or an environment, you want to have the food for your for your animals, right? Uh, so and one thing to point out too is that you know, they have also hymenome right there. They have her eyes right there. Very very cool animal. I have two because I'm just I just like them so much. So uh, octopus, of course, I know that octopus are because they're a modern animal. A lot of toys that are not prehistoric of them, obviously, but um, I found this like when you get those like those dollar store uh, uh, like kits of marine life that's not like super accurate. Uh, this one was in there, and it looks like either a like a one of those vampire squids or something. But I've seen fossil octopus look very similar to this. And again, they're like Jurassic age, and they're in this limestone, and it's just there. And, and, and it takes a trained eye to really see how it works, you know. But the idea is that it, they had a very similar look to this, though. So they weren't the bulbous headed things we have now. What makes octopus so unique among the cephalopods is that the only hard part they really have is their beak. So uh, there's stories of octopus, you know, slipping through like a, from one fish tank to another fish tank through three of the tubes. Because as long as the tube is small, bigger than their beak, they can squeeze their whole body through like a transformer re redefining itself. Um, here we have a squid. I like that it has like the colors of like the, 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 the Italian flag, I believe, um, or my field flag. But anyway, the idea is that uh, in general, I'm going to show you the giant squid. People get the name arms and tentacles mixed up. So it's essentially here, this is the head where the eyes are, right? There's a hypenome in the back right there. And here we have the, the, the mantle. This is where the organs are held. It's a torso for us. Uh, the arms are the, sh the shorter bits of the arms. And of course, these long things are tentacles. So these actually sit inside and they kind of, they're retracted. And when they want to grab prey, they shoot out and grab the prey, pull it in like this. So that's what you're looking at with tentacles versus arms. Arms, what you normally see. So octopus have eight arms. These guys have arms. In fact, my nautiloid over here, the octotheris, the red outer bits, those are the arms. And on the inside, try to pull that back. On the inside, you can see there's two little gray tentacles right there. So there's a difference there. Um, and, and what they're called, or why they're called that. But next we have, have a, 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 I want to say superstar of the fossil record, uh, the ammonite. Uh, if, you know, one of my first digs uh, was looking at ammonites. It was, you know, ammonite cast here in Texas. So basically what's going on there is the ammonite is living around, it dies, the soft parts go away, and then the shell is all the way, but the spotted sand is filled in with limestone, so it's a, it's a copy or a cast of it. Uh, there, I, I found them out in Fort Worth that general region of the Cretaceous rock. So again, you can see on the side here is your hypenome right there. And again, this is my, this actually was my first ammonite model. I was really excited to get it. Cause like, this is so cool because I just, they, they just didn't make them very often, you know, outside of a professional museum model making sets. But again, they have this nice coiled shell. So the idea compared to a nautiloid who has a straight shell, which works when you're darting around, but ammonites, um, they essentially have, well, smaller species have an idea that they can hide into a rock crevice. Also, all the shell cephalopods have chambers, different sections. They pump air into the chambers to rise up, and they pump air out and like water in to sink down. So um, that's why the name Nautilus sounds familiar for those of you who are who are big readers. The uh, twenty thousand leagues under the sea. You have the Nautilus, uh, the submarine. Same principle actually. Uh, and you say, why would they pump air and water in? And the idea is that would you want to swim thousands of meters up and down, or just pump water and float up or down? That's much easier for the animal. But again, you're seeing this really cool thing. And there is a beak in there. It's very, very hard to see. It's very, it's like a thought you it's painted black among black underarm. So yeah. um, a newer one we have is this guy here. And again, different, there, there's like thousands of species of ammonites. They're actually a good index fossil because they're uh, between Devonian period and the end of Cretaceous period, they die with dinosaurs. Uh, these guys essentially have, uh, or, or throughout the entire time, they have big pulses during the uh, the Jurassic and Cretaceous period, but you can see different shapes and designs to know where you are in the world. Uh, this guy again has this, has more spikes on the edge, but hypenome, has tentacles and arms here. So very very cool model. Um, one thing to point out, I, I do find interesting with all of these models, for the most part, if their eyes. And if you look at any modern squid or octopus eye, it looks very different than these very simple models. But I, I'm guessing. 
that toy makers don't want to put like a real looking eye because that may scare children or something. But anyway, um, so Ammonites we do know were eaten by plesiosaurs because one, this this one here from Safari shows it happening, uh, and two, we know you know we see the see bite marks. So the idea is they are another food source now. I'm sorry, ichthyosaurs. This is wow, plesiosaur, ichthyosaur, fish lizard. So uh, we know that that's happening too. But what's really neat about uh, this is that I know at the museum I work in, there is an ammonite fossil with a bite mark like right here, which means a mosasaur, because they match the mosasaur's teeth, bit right there, teeth to squid. That shows signs of selective feeding. What I'm saying is many animals, think of a, like a crocodile. They're just biting and snapping everywhere, right? Or an alligator. Uh, mammals and birds pick at our food. And the idea if you're picking at certain foods, that shows you're, you're, you're you know, you, this is, a way of measuring intelligence that you're not just grabbing anything you're going for certain things so for the mosasaur not to just bite the back of the shell where it's all shell but instead to bite here where it's meat calamari that shows intelligence there so kind of a fun fact so we know for sure that these three these three guys plesiosaurs mosasaurs ichthyosaurs are eating cephalopods so anyway kind of fun thing to point out now the last mollusk i want to go over is maybe not a mollusk in the Cambrian uh, period, there in the British Shell, in particular in Western Canada, uh, there is a guy, a little creature called Waxia, and we don't know where it fits in the fossil record. But most paleontologists who look into this go, it's something near a mollusk. So I know that for the casual observer, they look kind of like chitin, basically. But in general, we don't. In the fossil record, there's a lot of times where we find groups of animals that are here today. And there's groups that have no modern descendants, and we're trying to figure out how they relate to each other. So this guy is one of those things where, like, if it's not a mollusk, it's its own major group, but it's close to a mollusk kind of thing. So um, those of you kids out there, figure it out for us. Really need your help. That being said, that is our mollusk in, in a nutshell, and I'm, I'm going to go over some more uh, invertebrates pretty soon. Thank you very much. I'll see you later.